Okay, so we're talking about directional derivative. And so we said, we first started talking about what partial derivatives. These are two very specific derivatives, right? Derivative in the x direction. So, we're at, so we have a surface. We have a multivariable function. We have a surface. And say we're at this point right here on the surface. And if, if you just think about uh, strictly in the x direction, there's a rate of change of that surface or of that function, right? That's the partial derivative with respect to x. And if you think just strictly about, just look at the y direction, right? Strictly in the y direction, there's another rate of change, right? Those, that's how we started. But then we said we could take combinations, right? Combinations of changes in x and changes in y. And that would, the, the proportion of your change in x to change in y would give you some direction, right? Some direction that wasn't strictly in x or strictly in y, right? So really by taking some proportion of change in x and change in y that determines a direction and so we can get all directions around a full circle, right? And, in, and so for every one of those directions there's a rate of change of the, of the uh, function or of the surface. And that's called the directional derivative, right? It's the directional derivative. Okay, and so then we said well, of all those rates of change, what might be some rates of change of interest, right? What, would, what might be some rates of change of interest? The direction that gave us what kind of rate of change? Greatest, right? So maybe, and that'd be like if this was a mountain, it'd be like, which way should you go so that you would be ascending the hill the fastest, right? Have the greatest rate of change. So for this example, it was somewhere in the third quadrant there. And we know that direction is what? How do we actually get that direction? What's the direction of greatest rate of change? What's that? No, the direction. So. Yeah, the, the gradient vector itself points in the direction of greatest rate of change, right? And then if you want that greatest rate of change, then you take the magnitude of the gradient, right? The magnitude of the gradient vector will give us that, give you that max rate of change. And we, we showed the math where that came from last time, where the, uh, the angle between our chosen angle and the gradient, we want it to be zero, so the cosine was one. And so that means choose the, choose the direction of the gradient to be your u, your direction vector. Similarly, the direction of greatest <coughs> negative rate of change would be pi radians away from that. So in this case, something like this. So if you're on the side of a mountain and you're facing the, the, the direction of steepest inclination, your greatest rate of change, then direction of steepest decline will be exactly pi, or just do a 180, right, right behind you. And then what about well, some other another direction we were interested in? Zero. Yeah, zero rate of change. Which way would you go then so that you'd be, Z wouldn't change, right? And so which way was that? Okay, which is parallel to the contour line would be? Yeah, so it would be, so be this way like this. And this, we, we also showed mathematically that this was orth orthogonal to, orthogonal to the gradient vector, or the opposite of the gradient vector, would be orthogonal to that, would be this direction of zero rate of change. And there's two of those, right? There's two ways to do that. And those are uh, 180 from each other. So it would be this way. And then again over here. Close as I can get right there. Okay, so direction of max rate of change 
min, uh, max negative rate of change. So looking down on the xy plane, it's going to be like that's all orthogonal to each other, right? So this is so like if your direction of max rate of change is this way, your min rate of change is this way, and then your direction of zero rate of change is orthogonal to both of those. So let's say max direction of max, min zero and zero. They form that those four directions form uh, orthogonal lines basically and you had lots of practice working through all the through all the numbers in your your web work okay with this so in the last web work problem was the one that i want to talk about so what about the angle of inclination right so what about that that was the last web work problem so let's talk about that so i'm just going to pick a pick an angle here So here's an angle in the second quadrant. Here we've got positive x to the left and uh, positive y coming out at us. Okay, so I've, I've turned it this way a little bit. And we're going to head this way, so in the second quadrant. All right, maybe that's what, 5 pi over 6, somewhere around there. And we want to know what, so, and this is horizontal as well. And so now here is. This vector would have would kind of represent the rate of change at that point. And so then this angle right here, I'll call it beta. Angle of inclination, right? The angle of inclination of that associated with that rate of change. So how are we going to get that? How are we going to get the angle beta? We could use triangle trig, right? We could use, like I could make a, kind of like a, a triangle out of this. And so I heard inverse tangent, right? It's inverse tangent of opposite over hypotenuse, right? So opposite would be like this dotted line I've drawn. And then that red vector there is like the hypotenuse. So we've got, I've got, I want the ratio of this rise to this run. I want the ratio of how much z changes to how much we change in the direction of u. Well, that's, that should be, some light bulbs should be going off with that, right? What is the ratio of the change in z to the, ch the amount of change in the direction of u? What is that? So I'll loosely say dz du but that's not great notation but that's the idea do you recognize what that is dying to ask your question go ahead yeah i have an idea uh that vector the blue one yeah does that give it to us in the problem like that's you that's you that's the direction that we're going to decide we want the the rate of change in right so that we pick a direction and then we calculate the rate of change of the function. So that's representing the, the chosen direction, the unit vector u. Back to my question. So I need what? The ratio of opposite hypotenuse or kind of like dz per du. How many people think they know what that is? Be honest. Ouch. What is it? Why is it the hypotenuse the Tangent inverse. Right? I'm using tangent inverse. So you could use the hypotenuse if you use um, inverse cosine or sine. But I'm using inverse tangent. So tangent, inverse tangent, you'd use op oh, sorry, this is adjacent. Is that what you're yeah, this is adjacent side, sorry. Adjacent. All right, let's start on is that maybe maybe why I was confusing everyone. So the ratio of opposite to adjacent. Okay, now, which is, again, the ratio of this dz to how, how, how much you go, how far you go in the direction of u. So this is opposite over adjacent, which is dz over du. Now, how many people think they know what that is, that ratio? Not enough. Cody, are you going to tell me? Yes, it's a directional derivative, right? 
It's the rate of change of z with respect to going in that direction. That's exactly what that ratio is. And so that's the ratio we would put in to tangent inverse, and that will give you the angle, angle of inclination because it will give you the angle, this angle beta, tangent inverse of that ratio, which is fractional derivative. Okay, does that make sense? So that's the easiest way to do this. Okay, questions about any of that? So it's really important that you can see that, right? The, the directional derivative is what's well, the rate of change of the function going in the direction of u. So that would be exactly this ratio of opposite change in z to adjacent, which is how far, you, how far you're going in the direction of u. Any questions, comments? Okay, so uh, that's kind of a review from last time. So now we want to talk about the exam, and then we'll start new stuff. So the exam is Monday. Exam is Monday. That's 271. I want 272. So... In, I have, if you go to exam prep, exam prep here in Blackboard over on the left side, there is this new post called exam to study resources. Okay. You don't want to start studying Sunday night or even Saturday. You need to start studying before that. Okay. So uh, lots of resources and I'm going to add even more on Friday. First thing is I'm going to give you formulas on the cover sheet and I'm telling you what those are right there. That's going to be on the cover sheet you know exactly what formulas you will be given and which ones you will not be given. So these are the ones that will be on the cover sheet and that's right there in the exam resources. Right there. Okay, so here's some solutions to some recitation or the written homework. Uh, they don't match up exactly. All the problems are the same, but they don't match up with when you did them exactly. So you just have to hunt around for the right ones. Um, I'll, I'll also post more um, after you turn in the written homework Friday, I'll post those solutions as well. Okay, So the ones that you've already turned in, you'll find somewhere in here. All right, now here's a super important thing. Exam to practice. So in the book, I've given you, from the book, I've given you a bunch of review exercises. And that's just kind of like dr drill and practice of you know solving algebra type stuff. So it's good. Um, it's, it's helpful. You want to make sure you can... Solve all the basic problems, okay? But as you know, my exams are gonna test your understanding of things, and that's where the exam to practice comes in. These are all previous exam questions that I've, I've put on either an exam two or on a final exam that I don't use anymore. So these give you more of the flavor of the exam. So you, and this, there's a lot there, okay? There's many pages of practice problems. So again, you don't wanna start Sunday night or maybe even Saturday, you want to start before the weekend, start chipping away and working on these, get in groups, form study groups, work on these together. But in terms of having stuff to, work, to study that's going to be like the flavor of the exam, exam to practice. Okay? Because it's like past exam questions that I've written. I'll just, we'll just glance at it here. It's long. It takes a long time to load up. Almost. There we go. All right. So I got all kinds of lots and lots of great practice for the exam. Okay. Here's what it covers. Chapter 11, 5 through 7 and 9. Chapter 12, those sections. Again, problems, practice problems from the book. Written homework solutions. I'm giving you formulas on the cover page, so this this is very generous uh, resource guide here, resource set. Any questions about the exam on Monday? Oh, and so we will be staying long. So um, half of you, it should be no problem. You have recitation right after this class on Monday, right? 
so we'll not have recitation and we're gonna we're gonna we have I've reserved this classroom so we can stay longer if you're in Friday recitation and you have a conflict that you cannot change look for an email from me look for an email from me and we'll work out an alternate arrangement so you can have the full 90 minutes okay so don't you don't have to contact me about that just look for my email probably be maybe Friday ish or tomorrow something like that uh, and then just respond to the email and just follow my instructions and we'll figure out an alternate arrangement but if you don't have class if you don't have anything after Monday's class, then plan to stay longer to get the full 90 minutes. Corinne? Um, is there an assignment you need to practice that week? Yes, uh, I'll reveal that later. And it's some of them. I don't have all of them, but I have, I have a good portion of them. And I will reveal that later. I just, when you're practicing, it's, it's uh, if you're looking at, it's too tempting to look at solutions, right? So it's much better to work on something without having that resource of the solutions right there. Um, so I will. I'll just post that later. Let's post that later. Other questions? Okay. So start. So start planning your schedule so you can have multiple times to study. Okay. And just as a reminder that uh, all that stuff at the end of the first exam, we talked about all the surfaces, right? Parabolas, ellipses, double cones, cones, spheres, planes vector function, curves, and space. All that stuff is a, a good portion of the test. You have to know that because we're going to see those things all semester long. So you really have to know, like given, given uh, a picture, can you kind of say what, what it might be? And given a, a function, could you identify exactly what it is? This is a single cone, you know, with its vertex at this point opening in the negative y direction, and it's circular. Circular, single, like that kind of thing. You have, to, you have to really know that given the equations. And that's in the exam two practice, that's the whole first page. I'm not going to wait for that again. Okay? But the whole first page on exam two practice is that kind of thing. So make sure you know your, your surfaces by their equations. Okay, any other questions about the exam? Okay, so let's talk about. Alright, so back on this. Alright, we want to talk about, we talked about the differential, right? The differential, so let's review that. So, the differential was the change in z due to a change in x and change in y, and that was kind of how we form the foundation of directional derivative. So let's review that again. So if we're at this point, say, now I'm interested in this point over here. So I made a little change in x and a little change in y, and I want to know how much did z change for that little change in x and little change in y. So maybe remember, so dz. How would I get the change in z say from this point to this point. <coughs> so how much z changed from our starting point here to this point, given a change in x and change in y? Remember how we found that? What was that? Yeah, Corinne. Right. Partial of x. Partial respect to x, dx, plus the partial respect to y, dy. Okay, so if this point was like some starting point, say x naught, y naught, z naught, and this final point was any point, right, any point close by, say x, y, z, then what would dz be? How could I rewrite dz? So x naught, y naught, z naught is like my starting point, and then I'm making a small change in x and y to get some generic point close by x, y, z. What would dz be? What's that? dz. What would 
Foods and Beer. Yeah, Cody. No, it's a lot easier than that. I'm just, I'm starting here. I'm going to this new point. So how much did Z change? Z minus Z naught, right? That's DZ, right? And then we got the partial with respect to X. And how much did X change? It's minus X naught plus the partial with respect to Y. I ran, I'm not going to put the xy because I ran out of room, times dy, which is? Okay. And so, look, I can, I can move all these over, and I would have, and I can move the z naught, but let's leave, leave that as it is. So then I would have minus f of x, x minus x naught, plus minus f of i, y minus y naught, plus z minus z naught, equals zero, right? What is that? So if I knew my x naught, y naught, z naught, And I let x, y, and z vary, right? Vary around close to x, uh, x naught, y naught, and z naught. Then what is that? So I'd have a formula with x, y, and z in it, right? What is this thing? Coefficient times x minus x naught plus coefficient times y minus y naught plus 1 times z minus z naught equals 0. Someone remember? That's a plane. That's exactly the, the equation of a plane. Remember? That was our equation of a plane. So what plane is this? What plane do you get? Right, it's going to be the tangent plane, okay? So, remember this dz is just, what, the differential is really just an approximate, right? It's only really accurate for very, very small dx and dy, but if dx and dy are large, you move away from that point, well, the surface curves away, right? The surface curves away. This is a linear, this is what's called a linearization of the function, or when, when dx and dy are, are small, it gives good approximations for dz. But when dx and dy are large, you know, that plane can, the, the surface can uh, curve away from the plane. And so then it's no longer uh, uh, an approximation for the, for the surface. Okay, so we got our differential. Really, the differential is really equivalent to if you let that point, that second point rove, it would be roving on a plane. So the differential is based on points on the plane tangent to the surface at that point. Okay, let's talk about what about tangent, some special tangent lines here. What if I wanted to get the tangent line at in the x direction. So, so here's, I'm pointing in the x direction, and that this black vector here is showing what the direction of the line that would be tangent to the surface in that direction. I want to write the equation of that line, right? So I want to write the equation of that line. That line right there, okay? So how do I, that's parallel to the yz plane. No, parallel to the xz plane, right? Parallel to the xz plane. So in the direction of x, I want to write the equation of that line. What do I need? How am I going to do it? What's that? 
Y doesn't change. Okay, so that's going to have to do. So what do I need to write the equation of a line? Hover in space. Point and a direction vector, right? So what point do I have? I have X naught, Y naught, Z naught, right? So I'm good. That's easy. And now what do I need? I need the direction vector of this line. So I showed you that here. This is the direction vector. So how how can I write that as a vector? If I how can I write that as a vector? Right. So that's parallel to the x z plane. What's that? With the gradient. Oh, the gradient is a vector that points. It's in the xy plane that points in the direction of max rate of change. This is the gradient back here like this. So this vector is definitely not the gradient. What's that? OK, it has to do with our partial derivative with respect to x. Right? So, and I think, Karen, you said, what's, what's the y coordinate of this? So how much does y change in this vector here? That's our 0, right? OK. Now all I need to do is get the x and z components of that vector. How can I write the x and z components of that vector? Yeah, Cody. So we don't need the directional derivative because we're strictly in the x direction here, right? So what can we use? Partial with respect to x. So how does the partial with respect to x allow us to write what the x and y component, x and z components would be of this vector? How could we do that? How could we write for x and z components that would give us this direction right here? Nice. So like for any change, we said for so the partial derivative means that for any change in x, right, the change in z is the partial, right, so given any change in x, the change in z would be the partial, what, times that change in x. So I want to get an actual vector here. I want to make it easy as I can on myself. What should I do? What should I make dx? If I make it 1, then my z component will simply be partial with respect to x, right? So given any change in x, the change in z will be that change in x times the partial with respect to x. So what's the equation of that line? So the so are my x. My x direction tangent line would be what? Remember the equation of a line? Remember William? Uh huh. Oh, let's do the vector vector equation. Good. So it'd be x y z equals the point x not y not z not. Plus t times what's my direction? One zero partial with respect to x. Cool. All right. And then what would be my uh, y direction tangent line? So we could just we don't have to go through that all again. We could just write it down now. It'd be x y z equals. Initial point plus. So now what would this part be? T times. Right, zero change in the x direction, and then one fy. So 
So those are those two lines. That line, that's the in the x direction. Tangent to the surface in the x direction. Tangent to the surface in the y direction. So if we've got the, the tangent line in the x direction, the tangent line in the y direction, those two lines form a, what do they form? What plane would it be? be the tangent plane. It should be this plane, right? So let's do it. So, so we're going we're gonna to find out, based on these two lines, we're going to write the tangent plane, and it ought to be this, right? It ought to be the same as this. So how am I going to figure out, given two lines, how do we find the equation of a plane? Cross product what? I need I need a cross product. You cross product vectors, right? So what vectors am I gonna cross product? Direction vectors, right? If I cross product the direction vectors, that will give me the vector orthogonal. That'll be the normal vector to the surface, right? The normal vector to the surface. And then I'm just gonna use that normal vector in the point and write the equation of the plane. So cross product, here we go. It's gonna be cross, so we're gonna do the our determinant, i, j, k, of 1, 0, f, x, 0, 1, f, y. So the cross product is going to be, so my i component, 0, will be minus f, x. Make sure I do the math right here. And my j component will be, okay, 0 this way, minus f, y. And what's the z component? 1 minus 0. So there's my cross product. And that, so that's the normal, normal vector to the surface and also normal to the tangent plane. OK? And so look, I've got what? I've got the point x0, y0, z0. And the the vector minus fx minus f of y1 is that this plane right here. Yeah, because you got, look, because you you're, use your normal vector, a, b, c, your coefficients, and they're there, minus f of x minus f of y1, and then you plug in your point, x0, y0, z0. So that works. So you get the exact same plane. So this is the normal plane. Sorry, the tangent plane. The vector that defines the tangent plane is normal to that plane, right? Or normal to the surface. So this is this is the normal vector which defines the tangent plane. <laughs> okay, so for that plane, so that's the tangent plane and it extends infinitely. But close to that point, that that tangent plane is what's called the linearization of the function. The linearization. The linearization of the function is a way of approximating values of that function, but it only works when the when when you're close to the point, right? It only works when you're close to the point. So the linearization. is the tangent plane close to x0, y0, z0. And so we can make a function out of that that helps us estimate values of z of that function close to that point. So we can go back to, to do that, let's go back to our this right here. I'm going to take this right here, and I'm just going to solve for z. So z, right? So we can make a multivariable function. We can say z equals l for linearization, a function of x and y. And what will that equal? That will equal all this stuff plus z naught, right? So it will be f of x times x minus x naught plus fy times y minus y naught. What's that? No, not in this. I'm doing this, right? I'm just taking z naught and adding it to the other side on this one right here. Just the differential, right? So 
So this is that same tangent plane, but written as z as a function of x and y. That's called the linearization. And it's used for points close to the x0, y0, z0. If you, if you get far away from x0, y0, z0, the linearization will not go, be a good approximation unless, unless the surface is very almost planar, right? So that surface curves away from the, line, uh, the tangent plane, then uh, you, this will not be a good approximation of that surface or that function. So linearization, what? An approximation of f. So this approximates f. Near x naught y naught z naught. Okay, questions on all this stuff that I wrote. Tangent plane, normal vector, <coughs> tangent lines, right? So we did tangent lines, the tangent plane, the normal vector, and the tangent plane, thinking of it as a function of itself, as an approximating function to the function near the point x is not, y not, z not. What's that? Yeah, right. How close is close? I mean, it's, it's kind of subjective subjective thing, right? So if, if this surface were almost like a plane, then you'd have more leeway. You could go away further and it'd be a good approximation. If it was a really crazy surface that, that, like, that had high curvature and lots of directions, then you're, you would be restricted to your dx and your dy or your, how far you are away would have to be much closer for it to be a good approximation. So it's totally subjective. Yeah. Um, I suppose you could you could design some kind of like you know parabolic surface that approximated it and would do a better job. I don't I don't know of any. We don't really. But the linearization is like the nice easy one, and so it works great when you're really close to that point. If you zoom in far enough on a surface, it'll eventually look planar, right? Just like if you zoom zoom in far enough on a curve, it eventually looks linear. Same thing. Okay. So let's do a differential example. <coughs> All right, so here's an example. A large block of ice is 4 feet by 4 feet by 1.5 feet tall. As it melts, the height decreases as fast as, as each of the lateral square side lengths. Use differentials to estimate the change in volume that occurs when the height decreases by 1 inch. Okay, so I'm going to take attendance fast and see how you guys can do. So work together. You want to use differentials to estimate the change in volume, right? So that's the key. You're trying to estimate the change in volume. Use differentials to do it. See how much progress you can make because I'm talking way too much where's DV gonna come from how are we gonna get DV <coughs> okay it's gonna have to do with partial derivatives it's true but in general what is DV gonna equal Where is it going to come from? What's that? Is that it? So what is V? V is? So X times Y times Z. But we know that it's square, so <coughs> squared Z, right? So dv is going to be partial with respect to x times dx plus partial with respect to z dz.
Okay, what's the parcel with respect to x? 2xz. What's the parcel with respect to z? x squared. Just curious, did anyone, was anyone able to get this before I started doing it? About four or five of you, okay. This making sense? So we, it's based on our volume of a cube, right? Our volume of a rectangular thing. And in this case, we got x squared z, so we only have two variables. So our dv is gonna be the parcel with respect to x times dx, right? This is constant rate of change. This is our constant rate of change. And then parcel with respect to z times dz. So then we just plug everything in. What is, so two times, what's x? Four times 1.5. What's dx? Well, dx is, is how much the lateral side lengths change, right? What's well, going to be the side change in lateral side length? Negative a half, right? Over 12. Right, so that's the number of feet that the lateral side lengths decrease because it's half as much as how the height decreased. So plus x squared is four feet, so four squared times negative one over twelve. Are you following this? Does it make sense? Inches and feet. Right, so that the change the change in side lengths is, is inches, these are in feet. So I'm just converting the inches to feet. And that'll be dv, whatever that turns out to be. So did, did I lose you? Does it make sense? So we need our you need your basic formula for volume so you can get these partial derivatives, which allow you to write dv. Please. Uh -huh. Yeah, so if you do fx dx plus fy dy plus fz dz, and then, you're, you, then you'd have what, two, this would be xz dx, and then you'd, you'd, have, you'd, have y, you'd have yz dx and xz dy, and then those two added together should give you the same thing as this right here. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you got written homework for we got lots to do. Written homework for Friday, web work, start studying, okay? Test is Monday.